the next question is, uh, and this is where, uh, Grayson, we really want you to uh, shine. What is expropriation? Uh, in Montreal, uh, there's that term preemptive right. Um, are they the same thing? Are they a little bit different? Uh, can you explain what the difference is there? And do the expropriation proposals contained in the FMTA report chart a, visible, a, a viable path towards expanded uh, social and affordable housing stock? How does expropriation or similar tools, and what might they be, uh, like preemptive right, fit within the broader scope of municipal government strategy to address housing? How viable is it? Grayson, over to you. Great, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, let me just say thank you all for being here and having me be a part of this. I'm, I'm thrilled to be part of such a brilliant panel. Um, I'll start by, I guess, just addressing expropriation as I understand it in Toronto. Um, and essentially expropriation is like a legal mechanism that allows the government to force the sale of private property. Um, so it's, it's a way in which the government can subject private property rights to the public good broadly. And sort of the way the government articulates that is they can use expropriation when it is fair, sound, and reasonably necessary. And insofar as I understand it, the reason for an expropriation generally is not up to questioning by courts or by um, uh, other bodies to a certain extent, um, but the government has to pay market compensation as, as, Councilor, as Kristen mentioned. Um, and also, as Kristen mentioned, it is absolutely a tool of last resort. It does seem as though cities are very hesitant to use the power and only do so when, um, when it's cheap and when they feel like, confident they won't face much pushback on it. Um, so that's the broad sort of like mile high look at what it is. It's just a tool that allows a government, in our case, Toronto, but as well um, provincial and federal governments to expropriate, to take property without consent um, in exchange for a fair market value. Um, in my report, I proposed four different uses for expropriation. The first was in lieu of an inclusionary zoning policy. So as Craig mentioned, and this was exciting to hear, I hadn't heard this actually, uh, Montreal apparently just introduced one that it forces developments to introduce, you said 20% of all new units need to be affordable housing. Um, ish. Um, and so uh, expropriation in lieu of that would essentially be saying the government will expropriate 15 or 20% of every new development if, for example, Toronto doesn't have the power to do inclusionary zoning. So it sort of worked in lieu of that. And there are similar negotiations that happen now, often in exchange for things like parks or public artworks. Um, I'm forgetting the section that's, uh, that's used for that. Maybe Kristen will, will remember it, but um, it's kind of relatively normalized. The second proposal I had was to expropriate abandoned housing. Um, this feels pretty clear as to why it's good, especially in such a tight market now. Uh, it feels a bit absurd to let houses sit idly by. Um, I also would though include things like financialized abandonment. So looking at things like condos bought as speculative investments left unattended or, or left as Airbnbs, sort of forcing or encouraging the government to take those properties for fair market value and put them to use as affordable housing um, just, to, just to get more houses on the market. Um, the, the abandoned housing in, in the more traditional sense has been done by Toronto already. So 194 Dowling was a building that was abandoned down in Parkdale um, that the city expropriated and that's now run as affordable housing. I think it's run as social housing um, by uh, the Parkdale Activity Recreation Center. I'm, I'm forgetting the name right now, but, um, and that happened in the early 2000s. Um, my third proposal was to use expropriation to punish negligent landlording. So this would be expropriating landlords who fail a certain measure of maintenance standards two years in a row. In Toronto, we have what's called Rent Safe Toronto, which is a grading mechanism to, to see how landlords are or are not meeting the requirements. Um, and I, I proposed expropriating landlords who failed to pass that grade two years in a row. Um, and this also feels relatively clear on its face. It doesn't seem like it's justified to allow landlords to so negligently maintain their housing that the city itself is saying it's failing, getting a failing grade. Um, and, and instead, I would encourage the city to take those properties and to do the renovations necessary and then from there to operate them as, as affordable housing. And then the final proposal I had was to expropriate any landlord over a thousand, who owns more than a thousand units. And this was um, the more ambitious proposal, <laughs> I would say, that I, I pitched. And it would essentially see the removal of financialized landlords in the city. Um, and, and that to me is, is, I think, most exciting and probably most urgent. If we're, if we're serious about a right to housing, and if we're serious, I think, about grappling with affordable housing for, for a long term. Um, the obvious difficulty will be in funding that. And as, as Kristen mentioned, it would, it would, I think, absolutely need to be done across all levels of government. Um, but I think is, you know, not sufficient on its own to guarantee the right to housing, but I think a necessary step in decommodifying housing 
by absolutely removing the financialized landlords that exist in the city who are, as mentioned, so predatory in their approaches and so destructive in their effects on the housing market. Um, I will just quickly talk about why I think these are important. I want to just mostly emphasize that tenants face landlord, uh, face expropriation constantly. I think the experience of being a renter is one of precarity all the time. And we face expropriation not through the city, but through things like rent eviction, where landlords, like with expropriation, are forced to pay us compensation. I'm a renter, so I'm saying us. Uh, are forced to pay, uh, pay us uh, compensation to take our property without our consent. So when you get a rent eviction notice, you don't really have any way to fight that. And it is incredibly difficult to pursue any charges after the fact. Rent eviction, for those who don't know, is the process of filing for an eviction of a tenant to renovate an apartment, often done very dubiously and very often done by these exact landlords. Um, and so the threat of expropriation isn't novel to people in the city. It's just it's being used against the poorest of us. <laughs> so I think the reason I'm proposing these policies is to essentially expropriate the expropriators, as it you know is commonly put it, puts the tool of expropriation to use against the people who can most afford to pay for it and are most apt and, and able to bear the consequences of it. Um, it's sort of asking the question of what kind of landlords we actually want in this city and who we want to be in control of our housing. Um, I will just quickly touch on whether I think it's a viable path. I mean, I, I proposed it hoping it would be. <laughs> and so I like to think yes, um, but the money is, is hard. And I think that will be the hurdle. And I, I would say too, it is a, a um, approach to housing that is um, antagonistic intentionally in, in a way that will face opposition, I think, especially from developers and private landlords. Um, and I think part of the reason I think expropriation is a good mechanism to be using is for exactly that reason. I think it, unlike a lot of other proposals, expands our imagination for housing in ways that allow us to make demands that are maybe unrealistic, but become more feasible in contrast. So I think of Berlin that's been pushing for expropriation. And while they haven't won expropriation of their largest landlord, they have won a rent cap. And so I think we get to see these compromises that people in the center or on the right wouldn't make otherwise when they're faced with a viable threat of expropriation as is coming from grassroots movements now and hopefully you know, counter it bit by bit. Um, I think I've gone over my time a little bit, so I'll stop there and I'll pass it off to the next people. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. That's a very helpful explanation. Craig, can you speak to the Montreal experience and this preemptive right that um, has had some traction in your city? Craig? Sure. Um, thank you so much, uh, Grace. And I mean, that you, you, you pretty much sized up a really uh, a report with so much more information, so that's good. And, and I, I, was, I found it very interesting to read as well. Um, so I suggest all uh, people who are attending this uh, panel to, to, to check it out. Um, in Montreal, again, it's a recent uh, power that we were, were given, the right of re first refusal. We had to create a bylaw in order to do it for housing in Montreal. We have a separate bylaw as well to do it for parks and, and uh, other forms of like community centers and stuff. And how it works basically is that uh, we have to, uh, we have to pick lots um, that we, where we advise people that we were, where we're we're citing your lot for um, first refusal if there's ever an offer made on your lot. Uh, we picked 300 um, and we sent, basically it's, it's a very, it, administratively as well with the way it's done, it's very heavy on the civil service. They have to send out bailiff letters to all these people, make sure they receive it and everything. And uh, basically it's an advisory that look, your lot is now uh, under the sub subject of uh, first refusal by the city of Montreal for 10 years. Uh, we've chosen obviously the lots in neighborhoods that we wanna do uh, more investment in social, uh, uh, social affordable uh, off-market housing. And again, we've done it uh, for areas that will probably be facing redevelopment. We want to have parks or a community center or something like that. And so uh, those go out and we did in fact use it. Now, every time somebody makes an offer on one of those lots, it's in a registry, the city is advised and the city has 60 days to respond uh, whether they're going to buy it or not for the same price. And this is important for the same price as the offer that was made. Um, again, that is pretty quick for a city because it has to go through, you know, the civil service, uh, legal departments, housing departments, executive committee, uh, city council afterwards. So 60 days is rather fast for a city to act. Uh, but, you know, we do have these lots sort of already set out and some are pre-analyzed, you know. So we had a really good opportunity with one lot in the parking extension, a neighborhood that's facing rapid economic transformation and, and housing prices are a very big concern there. Um, so we were able to, uh, to jump in on a project, a place that we'd hoped to, uh, to acquire uh, previously, but with the right of first refusal, we were able to get it for the same price that it was sold on the market. And 
And sometimes that's a really good thing. And again, I can't speak for other cities or the provinces or their experiences, but sometimes when a city comes to buy a property, all of a sudden the price goes up, even if, uh, even if it's you know through some sort of expropriatory measure, the price tends to be higher. And the, tri and the tribunals at the end that uh, are going to you know to rule on the price, they're often a little bit higher than the market. So this right of first refusal for us so far in our experience, we're showing that the prices are just a bit better. So that's a better deal, which means if we can buy more land for off-market housing, we can get more uh, existing units and, and refurbish them for, for affordable housing or social housing. So it's a pretty interesting tool. Uh, another thing that, that it's important to note with this tool as well is that uh, it can be used for negotiations as well. So uh, if you have a right of first refusal on a lot or two in an area that's about to be redeveloped, and uh, a developer's coming in and asking for some sort of zoning variances, be it uh, density, uh, usage, whatever it means. If you've got a hold on some of the lots, uh, they might want to negotiate with you to get certain lots in exchange for other ones in the same neighborhood, uh, in which case you might be able to squeeze them <laughs> for more money or for more land or, you know, so there's an opportunity there. Uh, and that can be also done with the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, bylaw that we have for parks and community centers. So. Uh, it's a really cool tool. Uh, it's complex. It can be heavy in its current form. But again, we're following what Quebec laws allow us to do. So we have to operate under their legal legislative framework. But it's proven to be pretty interesting so far. And it's still in its nascent stage. We're still, you know, getting used to it and looking to see whether, you know, more lots are going to be added to that list or, or not. But we started off with a big chunk at 300. And uh, I think it's something that uh, hopefully that uh, the government of Ontario would give uh, the Toronto power to do. Uh, Kristen, what about uh, Toronto? What do we? What do you think of um, expropriation? And this is a new idea. I haven't heard this before. Preemptive um, right. Your thoughts? Yeah. No. And uh, Craig, I think um, uh, when I heard about preemptive rights, the first thing I did was I actually ran to the city solicitor saying, "Hey, Montreal's got this new power. Uh, should we be looking into it as well?" And uh, her response was that uh, number one is yes, we can look at it, and and and, and we probably should. Uh, but but a couple of quick thoughts. Um, Number one, the city of Toronto would need to have those powers. So somebody must give us the power to therefore uh, compel the first right of, of refusal. So the first right to, to purchase. Um, and that could be done through an amendment through the Expropriation Act, which is provincial legislation, or through the city of Toronto Act. So it's our, it's our own body of, of, of law that governs the things that we can and cannot do. So already the city of Toronto has more powers than any other city in Ontario. But, uh, but many people would say it's not enough. Um, so then the, then the question of whether or not preemptive rights could be um, technically applied uh, in, in a way that will allow us to extract the benefit. And I would say it can, um, but there are some caveats. And one of the big caveats is that we, we, we really right now are in a, in a highly speculative market-driven real estate um, sector. So and one acre of land in the downtown core uh, is gonna set back um, anybody, anybody. It doesn't matter if you're building a hospital uh, or, uh, or a condominium, uh, the, de the, the developers are driving up that acre of land and it's sitting about 50 to $60 million per acre. That's before you do any site work, before you even plan it out. You have no idea what you're putting on there. That's just your basic land cost. So the question for, for the city is can we then put ourselves in front of the other offer, the developer's offer, anybody else's offer, and, and meet that price, and then, um, then go about building the rest of the business plan to build whatever it is that we're looking for, whether it's hospitals or schools, or in this case, the desire to build affordable housing. So as long as the profit center is built into the speculation, um, Cities are not building condominiums. Cities are not interested in extracting profit from the real estate. We're interested in building affordable social housing. And so it will always be a case where we will probably not be able to match the price of the other buyer who is using it for a different outcome. Even if our, our intended outcome is, is for the public good. So it, it clearly serves a, a public interest um, component. Um, which is why I think the preeminent right we should explore, but I think it will probably have some limitations just because our system in Ontario is so highly deregulated, not to mention we have a quasi-judicial 
provincially appointed land use tribunal that sits over the province called the Ontario Municipal Board, now rebranded called the Local uh, Planning a Appeal Tribunal. The final decisions are not, uh, when it comes to land use planning and development, does not rest in cities. So, uh, so th these are two of the biggest challenges I think about building these complete and sustainable and livable neighborhoods is because we have this massive system of deregulation in Ontario that doesn't exist like in any other province, any other state. We're the only ones in North America that have this crazy overriding uh, provincial body that can overrule city decisions. So already the city of Toronto, even the fourth largest city in, in North America is set back in, in controlling how we build and grow our city. Um, coming back to the issue of expropriation, and I think this is um, a critically important component. I love, um, Grayson, your proposition that we push it out for discussion and, and make that a, a point of um, a, a goalpost. So therefore, having the evaluation, uh, evaluation matrix of when do we expropriate and under what terms does someone, uh, should we expropriate, um, I think is critically important because right now in the past, it's, it's a bit random as, as, what, as I see it. It is used as, as a, thre a threatening tool. Um, and oftentimes the city lawyers don't even want to actually uh, go through the formal process of expropriation. They just want to threaten expropriation and hopefully compel the seller to the table to negotiate an outcome. A, a willing buyer, willing seller, and, and an agreement that is negotiated under the, the, the mutually accepted terms. They're hoping that will ex accelerate the purchase. So it can be done. Um, in, in a way of using it as the boogeyman, we're going to th we're going to threaten you with confiscation of your real estate, and to a to a uh, landowner that is not well informed, it might scare them and say, "Oh gosh, the city's coming to take my property, and but I might as well just take their first offer and be done with it." But there are a lot of real estate lawyers and municipal lawyers out there that will probably contact that, that owner of, of, of real estate and say, well, actually, it's not just the market value appraisal that we have to contend with. There's also other costs and damages that you could be, um, uh, um, uh, that, that could be owed to you. And by the way, if you don't like the price, uh, you can also appeal it and uh, we'll get you a much better price down the road. And that could be anywhere from a two to three or five year uh, process and that's oftentimes why cities don't want to use expropriation uh, but we have had some successes I think largely by just even the threat of expropriation can sometimes compel a, 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 a unmotivated seller to become far more motivated.